morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever, whenever you're tuning in, um, welcome. So we are the Appreciative Recovery Show. We believe that emotional curiosity, self-compassion, and connection are foundational values that if cultivated as a daily practice, make any path toward wellness filled with joy and wonder. My name is Kelly Knox and I am the host of this show. Today we will be talking about the importance of authentic and deep connections in life and as we move towards death and how curiosity and self-compassion can play a role. So our guest today is Reverend Sue Kohler Arsenault. Um, Reverend Sue was ordained by One Spirit Interfaith Seminary in New York City in June of 2011. She is Dean of Second Year Students and on the faculty of One Spirit Interfaith Seminary in Manhattan, where she teaches on the spiritual care of the dying, religious injury, conflict, and working with couples on the path to marriage. Reverend Sue is a Promise Leader for Sandy Hook Promise. Earlier this year, Reverend Sue was sabbatical pastor of First Congregational Church of Rockport. She is seeking privilege of call as a minister in the United Church of Christ with hopes of pastoring a church soon. So welcome. Thanks, Kelly. Good to be here. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself and about your ministry. So um, for many years I worked as a hospice chaplain in upstate New York. And uh, towards the end of my time there, I began to realize that the quality of a person's relationships was the most important aspect of their inner being as they reach the end of life. And people who benefit from good relationships were able to find peace, and those who struggled with relationships had a much more difficult time at the end of life. Um, when you're good to others, people show up for you at the end of life. Mm -hmm. When you've had a rough time, um, there's a lot of repair work that needs to be done. So after spending a lot of my energy and attention working with folks at the end of life, it became very clear to me that trying to help people as they set out, especially in marriage, to develop skillful relationship would be a way um, to foster health and well-being for individuals, couples, and families. Because in a relationship, if it goes well, right, each person feels good, mm -hmm. the family works well, but when it doesn't, um, the trauma that it can be for each person, if there are children involved, and the way that that ripples out is, is so extensive. So I became really impassioned about helping people start in life, um, especially in their primary relationships, because we don't really teach that in this culture. Yeah, right. Um, during our pre-conversation, we talked a little bit about culture, and, and I had asked you, you know, what culture does teach it well? And neither one of us could really come up with one. So I don't think, I think it's a worldwide crisis, actually, right? Yeah. Not being able to relate to other people. So, um, so you, you just talked about the importance of connection, but can you um, talk, like extrapolate a little bit more on, on, on connection and how important is it for someone to have self-compassion when they relate with other people? Right, well, um, again, because we're really not taught how to develop relationships, especially when conflict arises, being compassionate to ourselves when we make mistakes, when things don't go well, being able to forgive ourselves and being able to forgive the other person or the other people is really essential to moving on from a problematic situation into a hopeful future. So the piece of self-compassion, um, to, to recognize again that we haven't been taught these skills mm -hmm. and to be gentle with ourselves as hopefully we try to grow and become more skillful at how we do relationship. How much more likely is it that you'll have compassion for someone else if you have self-compassion and vice versa if you don't have self-compassion? That's a great question. Um, I think they're interrelated and when I've got to think about this. <laughs> um, the two are inner, you know, I think most people don't even think about self-compassion. It's not know. even on the radar. And when we even hear the word compassion, the first is compassion for the other. Um, 
And yet for, for our own inner healing, without that piece of self-compassion, we'll always fall short for how compassionate we can be to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, the two are absolutely inextricably intertwined. Right, right. Um, my mind just kind of wandered into other territory. But um, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, we talked about Susan David also off yes. camera and, and her work around emotional ag agility. Is that yes. what it is? I I explain to our audience what exactly is emotional agility. So often, um, and I saw this a lot in hospice at the end of life, when emotions arise that we label as bad, so anger, sadness are two examples. When those emotions arise, if we label them as bad, we distance ourselves from them. And we are less able to um, enter into situations where we, that are on their own merits sad or difficult. So for example, at the end of life, um, often people will say, don't cry, it's okay. Uh, um, right. Or, or if, when someone has died, oh no, I can't cry. Um, as if somehow crying is a bad thing. And so rather than allow ourselves a full range of emotional expression and to learn what is the message that's within that emotion, because usually there's, there's something that that emotion wants to, to tell us. And that message really will help us towards healing. Mm -hmm. But when we shut that down, we distance ourselves from ourselves and we distance ourselves from other people. And again, at the end of life, um, often the person who is facing death is filled with emotion. But if that person doesn't feel that he or she has permission to express that emotion, then there can be a distancing and a pulling back. And a person, rather than feeling the love and support and connection of a family, can actually begin to feel more isolated mm -hmm. and more withdrawn. And although withdrawal is a natural part of what happens in the dying process, there's something else that can be most unfortunate that can um, fracture relationships at the end if we can't allow for what we consider bad emotions to be um, okay and just considered a part of everyday life. Right. Yeah, so one thought around that for me is um, when someone says, when I say, oh my God, please don't cry. It's because I do not want to feel what they're feeling. I don't want to. I don't want to experience that. How do you get around that? That's right. So it's exactly. Usually, when we're shutting somebody else down, it's because of our own discomfort. Right. 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 So learning how to simply be with our feelings, um, whether that's through a practice of meditation, whether it's being in a safe, supportive environment where we're given our permission to feel our feelings and know that it's okay. So maybe in a conversation with a minister or a therapist or a friend, um, to just simply become comfortable and trust that on the other side of having a meltdown, we're actually gonna be okay. Right, right, which now makes me think of the, the first C, emotional curiosity. So if, um, how does that play a role in, in, in learning how to be open to deeper connections? That's another great question. Okay. So, <laughs> so emotional curiosity, right? So when these feelings arise, um, to inquire, to try to within, what's underneath that? Why do I feel angry, fearful, sad? Why does this person feel angry? fearful or sad, and to, to try to get at what's underneath that, mm -hmm. um, then that allows for a much more meaningful exchange. Because yeah. if I can find out why you're upset and not just distance myself from those feelings, then we can grow closer. Right, yeah. So some people are really gonna have a difficult time with that. It, it can be painful to ask yourself why, no? Absolutely, um, because in our culture, we have been taught that those feelings aren't okay. Um, many of us, especially if we've had loss as children, we're never given an opportunity to look at those losses, to grieve. And so many of us hold inside 
some very deep pain that hasn't had um, a place to be expressed and to be um, held in a compassionate way. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when we begin to open that lid, we can be surprised what comes out. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, some some people would, and I felt this, you know, too, through processes, overwhelmed by that and not quite sure how, like they think they're gonna explode or die or. Absolutely, and, and one place that I see it often is if a child has lost a parent or a sibling and that that loss was never dealt with, mm -hmm. um, sometimes the pain of that is so great that it comes out the sides through addiction, through drug use, through depression, right? Feelings that are, have not been processed can often go to that place. Mm -hmm. And so when, when these do start to come up, um, because it's been held on and perhaps uh, those patterns of thinking uh, get, repe get repeated and entrenched. And so it's more likely that uh, rather than establishing healthy ways to deal with difficult emotions, it just gets worse. Right, right. And, and it's not really something you can think your way out of. No, it's not something you can think your way out of. Yeah. So um, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about the, you know, like we'll use your example of someone losing a parent as a child. Now, what, how, sometimes that can have the effect of just isolating oneself and having an inability to really even understand how to connect with other people. So if, you, if you're, you're a person who doesn't really have the skill set, doesn't really know, know what a deep connection feels like, so you have no reference point, where do you start? That's another excellent question. <laughs> so be, finding ways to be part of healthy community um, can be a really good place to start. And whether that's a healthy church community, a healthy bowling league community, uh, a place where you feel like you can be yourself, where you're accepted as you are, um, those are places that can begin a person to feel like I'm okay and from there it's it's easier to step into disclosing more of who I am both my gifts and my struggles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay one more question around that and then then we'll move on so you're you, you make a decision I'm gonna learn how to connect with other people because I have no clue so I'm gonna go be part of a healthy community how do you know if it's a healthy community? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I love that question. So um, what, I'm, what I'm most familiar with are spiritual communities, mm -hmm. and there are certain um, hallmarks of healthy spiritual community. So in a healthy spiritual community, I feel welcomed. Mm -hmm. I feel respected. I don't have to hide any part of who I am. The community's leadership is open and transparent. When I'm in that community, I feel good. I leave that community feeling inspired, feeling seen and heard. There is um, an atmosphere of listening that we listen to each other in healthy community. So those are so just some of the hallmarks of a healthy community. All right, that's really great. Um, so let's kind of turn it back to um, end of life stuff. So when, when I was first chatting with you about this, I was thinking about the person who is experiencing the, um, you know, going into um, death and their experience of relationship and how important that is. Let's talk a little bit about that. But, but there was a twist and something I hadn't thought of that we'll bring up okay. afterwards. <laughs> little tease. <laughs> so um, at the end of life, it becomes very clear that what is most important for a person to be able to look back over their life and say, yes, I had a good life and I'm ready to go, is the extent to which that person was able to love and be loved, right? So when we say a person is a success, it doesn't matter you know, how much money they have in their bank account, what professional achievements they had. Truly at the end, it's was this person kind and did this person receive kindness? 
And so um, when there have been healthy relationships, the person who is dying um, often, you know, friends and family want to see them, want to be able to express their love and their appreciation for that person. That person wants to express that to them. Um, and that is a hugely exhausting process for the person who's dying because that person is saying goodbye to, you know, a, a large group and, and then each person who's, who is saying goodbye to the one who's dying is saying goodbye to one person. Right. Um, so in, when that person has had healthy relationships, as the, because dying is so emotionally, physically, and spiritually exhausting, the circle of attention gets smaller and smaller. So somebody who once used to like um, to go to a party might find that they only want their closest friends around, and then maybe only their closest family, and then maybe only one or two people. And, um, and often the person who's dying will choose one person who's their safe person. And it might not be the person you would think it would be, but it is usually that person who can listen to them without judgment, who can take care of needs without having to be asked, who really takes the time to just be calm and be present with the person who's dying. Mm -hmm. um, and who doesn't have necessarily any expectations for how the dying person is supposed to behave. Mm -hmm. um, so even when the dying person has had the best and healthiest relationships, naturally the circle of people who that person really has the energy to be around shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until at the very end that um, in the dying process, it does truly become a solitary journey. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes families can be very upset when uh, the dying person decides to take his or her last breath without anybody there. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, why would you want to go when the people who love you the most and who you love the most are right there? Yeah, I had, I had a friend who's, whose mother was really sick and took her off food and you know she was just in the process of dying and every single day the family showed up and it wasn't the kind of family that was normally together mm -hmm. and it's like her dream that her kids oh. were together yeah. she lasted forever yeah and i kept thinking that that's because you guys are giving her a gift that exactly. you didn't give her in life exactly yeah. exactly and there are definitely those people whose satisfaction in life comes primarily from their relationships and you might look at them physically and you might know what the, a diagnosis is short term, but as long as they are feeling loved and cared for and they can express their love and their care, they can surprise uh, you know, the, the professionals <laughs> yeah. around how long they'll, they'll really they'll stick, stick around. around. Right, yeah, so that is amazing. Relationships really, really, really mean a lot to people, even if they don't admit it. They do. Right. Well, can I say just one more thing? Sure, yeah. So um, at the end of life, there is something really critically important um, when a parent is dying and being able to have his or her children nearby. Um, sometimes because, again, we have such a difficult time being in an emotional field of sadness and fear, you know, I, the, seeing our parent die is very, very painful. Mm. Um, but when we subcontract that out to professionals and think, well, I'm giving them the best professional care. Actually, it, that is so far less important. Um, having somebody who's gonna be you know, the best nurse, what's really is much more important and gives a sense of peace to the person is having those loved ones nearby. Now, it doesn't need to be that they're sitting there 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Even just knowing that that, that loved one is gonna come 10 o'clock every Monday morning, whatever whatever they work that out to be. Right. But there is no substitution for having, um, again, when the relationships are good, having those immediate family members a part of what's happening at the end and helping them, right? So if you're helping immediate family members be okay with the emotions that arise. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So um, the 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 teaser go back because I, I, Lord knows why I didn't think of this, but when I was thinking more like when a person dies, how 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 important is relationships to that person? But through our conversation, you know, uh, obviously the um, the relationship of the people being left behind, right? So you keep talking about families that have healthy ways of relating. That's probably like 1% of the human race. <laughs> no, you know, I'm kidding. Yeah. It's 2%. <laughs> but um, so sometimes people die and, and you don't have... Um, Absolutely. So um, you're right. There are a lot of families where the relationships are strained at best. And following the lead of the person who's dying... Um, if the person who's dying says, you know, I would really like to see my estranged daughter, to make an attempt to do that. Mm -hmm. But if the estranged daughter says, I really want to see mom, but mom says, no, I can't do Ouch. that, right? It's important to follow the lead of the person who's dying. dying. And because on a spiritual level, our relationships ex exist beyond the body, you know, if someone doesn't get that chance to say goodbye, doesn't get the chance to make peace, even after the person has died, there are ways um, through journaling, through prayer, through conversation that the person who's left behind can find their way to peace. Mm -hmm. um, but to really respect the journey that the dying person is on, if you follow that person's lead in how you care for them, there's nothing you can do wrong. Um, but sometimes other family members have agendas that they think, well, you know, mom and her sister, they should reconcile before um, mom dies. But if mom's not there, mom's not there. Yeah. That's and hard. It, I would imagine that is very hard. So um, um, let's see. What, what other things can you think of that would be important around this conversation that I'm not asking you? All right. So I guess the one thing that I would say is because um, of the importance of trying to learn how to do conflict well mm -hmm. as part of um, an inquiry process, an emotional inquiry process. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, like often that. in couples relationships, if someone has a problem and brings it to the other person, the first thing they do is become defensive. Mm -hmm. But if instead there can be a spirit of inquiry if the person who's receiving the issue can say, you know, um, gee, you're upset, can you tell me more why are you upset, rather than just default to their position. Well, yeah. right, that one skill, the skill of inquiry and conflict, can totally shift how two people can address a concern between them. Right, right. So a lot of what we're talking about is is avoiding this. The, the last things that we were talking about um, with a dying member is it not not wanting to see a family member. So um, again, I've lost my train of thought. But yeah, the the inquiry is 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 key. It's so hard to do. Right, Sue. Yes. So so if if in this example too of the family member not wanting to see, well, why don't you want to see this person? Right. And and then really listening that, well, and, and for the person who That's says, I great. don't want to see my sister, and, and then the person who's hearing that, to be able to say to her, I understand that you don't want to see your sister because this is so painful for you. Did yeah. I get that right? Yeah, and then reflection. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that that process, that mirroring process, can be so healing. To to really have our pain heard, and then you know, again, a deeper level of inquiry about what what's underneath that can be such a healing thing for somebody. Can it lead to her saying, "Okay, I'll see my sister"? Absolutely, can lead to that because sometimes. Once we feel like our issues have been heard and respected and understood, a shift can occur mm -hmm. that might uh, open us up to a new experience. Right. Because sometimes too, especially in families, if the estrangement has been lengthy, mm -hmm. right, these people have changed over time. Mm -hmm. 
and being open to the possibility that my sister isn't the same person she was at 25 right. as she is now at 60. <laughs> to use a, a be, to use a Buddhist term, beginner's mind. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Clear out everything, your preconceptions and your ideas. Be open. And be open. Be open. She may be the same person, and you may still not like her. Right. But you know what? She may be lovely. She may apologize for whatever infraction right. would, you know occurred. And sometimes, also, when there is estrangement, I would often guide someone to write a letter first. Mm -hmm. And and in estrangement, unless the each person can say, "This is my part," and I'm sorry, mm -hmm. will you forgive me? Mm -hmm. Right. So Di Dr. Ira Bach's work, um, the four things that matter most. Right. Um, he uses the Hawaiian Ho'oponopono tradition yeah. um, to help people ask those questions at the end that can lead to peace and to, to have a path at the end of the uh, end of life. So he'll talk about um, thank you, I love you, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, do you forgive me, and goodbye. Wow. And if people can do that process with each other, um, then peace is possible. Yeah. It sounds so simple and easy in your easy voice, <laughs> right? But it gets really complex. Really yeah, complex. And messy sometimes. And sometimes but it's worth it. It is worth it. And yeah. sometimes, too, you know, for somebody who's really having a hard time to be an ally, mm -hmm. to say, would you like me to sit with you when your sister comes? Mm -hmm. Right, that can sometimes be just that extra support that a person might need to stretch into a new dimension. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this with me. Well, it's been it's fun. With some wonderful information that you shared with us, so. Well, thank you, Kelly, and I wish you the best in your work. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for joining us. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Appreciative Recovery, you can visit us at appreciativerecovery.org. If you would like to learn more about Reverend Sue's ministry, you can visit her at revsue.net.